Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to be joined by Bill Sherman, who is the music director of Sesame Street. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm honored. Yes. So um, this is a really, really neat one because it's uh, it's I mean, it's Sesame Street. It's so cool. It's it's iconic. It is uh, truly, I can say, from being a dad of a, a young son and, and another one very soon, it is really, I think, the best kids programming that speaks so like clearly and respectfully to kids um so you guys do an amazing amazing job at Thank that you. that's fine yes so um and and you have two kids yourself so i think you kind of get that um but but this isn't just for people with children i think everyone out there either grew up with sesame street or things along th those lines um so just to throw out a few other quick facts though so you're a composer, producer, arranger. You worked on um, Don Quixote, which is a great show. Uh, Nature Cat, another great kid show, but but also Hamilton and In the Heights um, with Lin, Man Lin Manuel Miranda, uh, which you guys were roommates, right? We were. We were friends in college and then became roommates for way too long thereafter. And yes, <laughs> I mean, our good friends to this day. That worked out pretty well. Uh, yeah, he, he, he's done great things. So have you. And then you also have a podcast, Quest Love Supreme with... Mr. Questlove, uh, who everyone knows and loves. Um, so a lot of cool friends. <laughs> I have some cool friends. I do. I would. Yeah. I have some cool phone numbers in my phone book. It's all very nice. Uh, I, yeah, it, I never thought that that would be who I was. And now it just sort of is, it sounds super lame coming out of my mouth, but like, that's just sort of how it is. Yeah. And so it, the good part is, is if I want to ever hang out with my friends, I just have to find a job or go work with them because like <laughs> seeing them in a social situation is a very, yeah, almost impossible feat to accomplish. Yeah, because everyone's always working. But uh, yeah, that's right. So again, the topic today, I, I, I found out about you, actually, and I'll give him a shout out through Greg Wells, uh, the great engineer, producer, musician and drummer, um, mm -hmm. I believe plays A&F drums. Um, Greg posted something with with about you or with you. And, and I had been looking, trying to find information on uh, you know, someone to talk to from um, Sesame Street and the Muppets, which they're different. And we'll talk about that later. They're different and the same. So, mm -hmm. so we'll cover that. But um, so thanks to Greg, who I, I briefly talked to on Instagram and I've uh, been a fan of his for a long time. He's one of my favorite human beings in the whole world. And if you're into any sort of music, mixing, anything audio related, check out Greg Wells's Instagram or anything that he does. And he is a wealth of knowledge and also one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And I'd like to say a colleague and a friend, and we work together all the time. And he, uh, he, by the way, he also loves kids music. In fact, has written some songs for Sesame street and other things I've worked on. And, uh, he has like five children too. Yeah. So that would help. Uh, <laughs> and he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful human being and one of my favorite people. Yes, his I used to watch his mix with the masters uh, mm -hmm. series all the time for, um, you know, for it was for work. So I was like, you know, I'm going to learn a little bit from Greg. But yep. so I think everyone knows that Sesame Street is very, very music heavy, very rhythmic. There's a lot of famous musicians and drummers and celebrities who uh, who are on it. Um, I was watching it earlier today, uh, doing a little research for this, and just to kind of a few that came up right off the bat, which maybe we'll touch on these. Uh, I think some of them are before your time, which was started in 2010. But um, Anderson Pock was on some somewhat recently. Uh, Quest Love has been on there. Your buddy um, Ray Barreto, uh, Dame Evelyn Glennie has a great one, uh, which mm -hmm. is really really cool and talks about some interesting topics. Um, but beyond the famous drummers, which we can again talk about more later, there's Everything that happens in Sesame Street, I feel like you guys put music in and rhythm and teaching the importance of of that kind of stuff. So um, before we get into that, just kind of jumping around, why don't we how did you get that job? You know, that's like a dream job. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. And to this day, I, you know, the, my Sesame Street job, I call it uh, when I tell people what I do for a living, it, it's called the leprechaun effect. Like I say, I'm the music director of Sesame Street. And they look at me like I'm a leprechaun because there's no way that that can be a real job. And like, holy <laughs> cow, right? And so, so the way I, okay. So the way I got that job is like a series of fortunate, I will say, events. I, I went to college at Wesleyan University. I met Lynn manuel Miranda. We were friends. We worked on his shows. We graduated from college. We started working on In the Heights, uh, the off-Broadway version. Uh, and then at the same time, he and I and a couple of our friends played in this thing called uh, Freestyle of Supreme. Uh, Freestyle of Supreme, for those who don't know, is like an improvisational hip hop group where we get suggestions from the audience and like make up hip hop songs and blah, blah, blah. And so at, at that time, there was a woman, her name is Karen Fowler. She was developing 
a new electric company. And for those who don't know, the electric company was around in the 70s. It starred Morgan Freeman and Gene Wilder and Rita Moreno and all these great people. And so we were remaking it. And she wanted to base the electric company sort of around Freestyle Love Supreme, the sort of like riffy, hip hoppy, anything could happen at any time kind of vibe. So we made that show. And the electric company was in the same building as it is a product of Sesame Workshop. And so, so was Sesame Street. So, uh, Electric Company was sort of dwindling. We had made like 160 episodes in a year and a half, like something crazy. We had a lot of episodes. And then, and then it was, it was sort of, um, fizzling out as it were, as it was. And, um, and Sesame Street was just looking to turn over some of their people. The guy actually who I replaced, who's very famous, also a percussionist, Danny Epstein, had been the music supervisor since 1969. And uh, I believe retired at age 90 or something like that. Wow. And so uh, and so anyway, I went there. I went for like a series of interviews over a year and a half. I remember coming home to my then wife and being like, hey, uh, there's a possibility that I could be the music director of Sesame Street. And she's like, that's not a real thing. I was like, I know it sounds crazy. I can't even <laughs> believe it. Blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I went in. I had an interview with the guy who played Elmo. I had an interview with the president. I had an interview with the head of production and all these people. And. I had no idea really what I was doing. I was still like 20. Uh, I got the job in what, 2010 when I was 30. So yeah, this was like, I was 26, 27. I was still pretty young. Uh, I had one TV show to my name. Um, in the Heights was sort of becoming a thing and like maybe it would, it maybe would turn into something great, but nobody really knew, you know? So anyway, so I walked in there and I, I guess I wooed the right people and did the right thing. So I got the job at Sesame Street and I just, I still to this day, like find that really hard to believe i've been there for 13 years it's it, it some days feels like no time at all has passed and then sometimes it feels like you know we've got this incredible machine running and it's it's we're doing new things all the time and we're we're dealing with all kinds of content that's like important in the world and i also feel like that job once i got it like and to this day is like so important uh yeah. just for like from a learning aspect and from a teaching aspect and just from like a you know, I do other jobs that are not as important as Sesame Street. Let's just put it that way, you know? <laughs> and so, so, um, so this just, you know, and so this, to this day, like, I always feel like that's the most, no matter what I do, that's the most important job I have. And I put it like way above everything else. And I always try to challenge myself to keep the level of music and musicianship and creativity at its highest, because if not, somebody else should be doing that job, you know, like it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be like, I'm just holding on to that job. Like we should really be pushing the envelope whenever we can. So anyway, yeah. So yeah, that's how I got, I don't know if that was really answered your question. No, that's how that's, I got that job. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, yeah. And to this day, it's still just like a weird, like, and then I have, you know, we, I talk to people like this and like, and it's just like, oh yeah, that's right. It's, it still is insane that that's my, you know, that's like what's on my business card. I hand yeah. that to people and I go, Hey, and you know, what's interesting about the job at Sesame street is uh, you talk about some of the people I know it's, it's opened up so many doors and it's, it's, it's this really cool thing that uh, so many of us have in common. Like you said, in the introduction, like whether you're, whether you have kids or don't have kids, you grew up on Sesame street or you didn't like, I, I grew up as like a GI Joe, like that kind of kid. Mm -hmm. And so when I got the job at Sesame street, I did like a deep dive into Sesame street just to really get, you know, just to figure out what the hell was going on. Um, but, but a lot of, but the thing about it is that people have that in common. And so like, for example, when I met Questlove, we were working on, the Hamilton record. And it was like the first few days recording and then blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh yeah. And I'm the music director of Sesame Street. And immediately time stood, stood still because he's like a huge Sesame Street fan. And immediately wanted to like take me out and like hang out and like talk all about Sesame Street and all the things that he asked me. I had no idea what he was talking about for the most part. And I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. I was like, you're from the roots. Like you've been my favorite <laughs> band since I was 15 years old. Like, what the hell's going on? Yeah. And then we became really good friends. And like to this day, like we, you know, we do the podcast and stuff and we hang out and, and um, it's just a wild uh, relationship to have. Like he played, you'll appreciate this. My senior year of college, the band that played like the big spring concert was the roots. Hmm. And so like I was 19 or 20 or something. And so, and now years later, he's like, no way. And he remembers everything. So he like remembered that gig, which is, which is surreal to me. <laughs> wow. Um, but yeah. So it's just like, it's also weird how sort of those things these days are becoming full circle events. Absolutely. And you know, what's weird on that. Totally unrelated is my wife, in college ran some program that does bring those concerts here at the university of Cincinnati. And she, the roots played and she carried quest loves throne. Uh, <laughs> and, but like, it's such a simple little thing, but that sticks with her mm -hmm. to say, Oh, of course she told me, you know, being a drummer, yeah. but, uh, but um, pretty neat uh, connection there. But um, so I think you're right where it crosses uh, 
everyone likes it. It's beloved. I mean, at this point, and it's it's on HBO, which is kind of a big change, uh, obviously, from from originally being on PBS, which I'm I'm glad it's landed there and all that good stuff. But um, mm-hmm. all right. So drum stuff. Uh, you yourself, I'll clarify, are not a traditional drummer, but you did study African rhythms in college, as you said. You clearly have an understanding of it. Um, I guess the first thing to kind of jump in would be let's start with some fun stuff and talk about celebrity drummers, including your buddy Quest Love, um, coming on the show. And obviously, there's guitarists and all kinds of other musicians and singers that come through. But um, what is that process like to get a drummer? to come on, let's say Quest Love, where he does, he'd had a really cool um, kind of segment where he was teaching, gosh, I forget which Muppet it was. It was Grover. Um, it was Grover, where he was teaching Grover and they were playing together and Grover had his little kind of blue um, mini drum set. How does this all work? Maybe just give us the process of like writing the segment and then sure. performing. What's it like? I think it depends on the, it depends on the guests. I'll give you two examples. So the, with Quest Love, I, a couple years before that, he, he had always wanted to do be on the show or do something. So first he wrote a song that we did with Pharrell called uh, Be Is For Book. And then a year or two after that, he was our guest on the Thanksgiving Day Parade float, which was hilarious because <laughs> it was just like quests surrounded by a bunch of Muppets and it was very funny. <laughs> and then two years after that, he wanted to like physically be on the show. So, so, so the, our writers wrote this bit about... Uh, I don't even know what it was about, but it was about, it was about drumming and about like copying or something like that. Like, like Grover did something and then, and then, and then Amir did something. And so, you know, in true form, like he was all excited. He really wanted to do a bit with Grover. He he showed up his tech, uh, Keith McPhee, who's the roots tech showed up with one of his really snazzy looking Ludwig sets and set it up. And, uh, and then he just sort of, and so here's, here's a little piece of inside knowledge. So the guy who plays animal, also plays Grover, also plays Miss Piggy, also plays uh, Oscar, also plays a bunch of other things. Anyway, um, so for him, drumming like drumming with Grover uh, was a lot like drumming with Animal. And I remember that day, it was just sort of like, uh, like Grover played a bit, then Amir copied him, they went back and forth, and it was just hilarious and, and, and amazing. And, and every time they yelled cut, uh, Amir would be like, Bill, Bill, I'm like, what? You're like, this is insane. And it's like, I know, I know. I just, yeah, I know. Just like take it in, breathe, like get through it. And so he did, and it was just fun. And we, you know, he had a super good time. And, That's awesome. um, and yeah. And uh, uh, I mean, and my second example is like someone who actually played like a song. So Anderson Pock was on recently. I wrote a song for him called Holiday, yeah. which I was really proud of. And uh, Anderson's like a super cool dude. I sent him the tune. He texts me back. He's like, hey, I love this song. Can I flip it and like put change the key and like do some stuff. I was like, absolutely. So like over the span of a few days, he like went in the studio with his band. I think the guys from the free nationals and then um, recorded a bunch of stuff and said it to me. And it was just like exactly what it should sound like. Just like the dope Anderson pop version of my song. Right. And like, I always find it funny over the past 10 years or 12, whatever it is. I, anytime a rapper comes on and I have to rap like a demo for a rapper, it's like the most embarrassing thing uh, in my career. (laughs) So like, Common, for example, we were in the studio and Common was listening to me rap and he kept on saying, can I have more Bill in my headphones? Can I have more <laughs> Bill in my headphones? And I was like, why aren't we recording this? Because this is hilarious. And yeah. when else is Common you know, going to say that to me? So um, yeah, so Anderson came on and Anderson was just so excited to be there also and like was like a little kid in the candy store and like played drums on the set and was just like crushing it and like was nailing all of the fills that he had done and was just like super on it. And then I was at the Grammys a couple of weeks ago and I saw him in Silk Sonic and I was just like, damn, I can't believe you're on the set of Sesame Street and now I'm watching you do this, which is that band is super slick and yeah. really good. And yeah. that was a, like a hell of a show. That song um, is awesome. And and I, it makes me uh, ask the kind of weird drummer question of so Anderson Pox bass drum, the logo was covered. Is there a mm-hmm. reason for that? Just just kind of inside baseball. Absolutely. Talk. So the, you, we can't put any brand names on Sesame Street. So there's no, you know, all of the guitar he, uh, heads, the heads are, yeah. are, are, are taped over. And then if you'll notice, like in the um, in Hooper store, all of the brand names are like jokes. So it's like it's like people who are in the casts, Wheaties and blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. There's no actual like 
tide or you know whatever. sure so, yeah yeah and i noticed that uh quest love though his his ludwig seemed to have slipped through on the on the base track. i think <laughs> that because he is sponsored by ludwig yeah and because he like i pr- probably has stock in ludwig at this point yeah um that they let it slide yeah because he's i mean i've used that drum set that L- that ludwig breakbeat his his signature kit which man it's a small little kit and he has that super high tom it's it's a really cool setup but um, i also have one of those in the basement and i love it yeah um did you get one of them for your kids? He also makes like that. There's another breakbeat thing that's like the smaller version of that. Yeah, I've seen those. I have a little Ludwig accent set for my son, but I I did this uh, kids group. It was called Songs for Seeds, which is actually a big franchise in New York. Uh, and someone bought one and did it here. And I was the drummer in it for a couple of years. And that was just the drum set that was provided was the Questlove kit, which so it was funny. great. Tell him I enjoyed it. Uh, when you Absolutely. <laughs> some other good some other good Questlove gear knowledge inside baseball is <clears throat> he has his own sticks, right? which are made by Promart or whoever they're made by. Yeah. And um, I think his signature brand, he was telling me that they're longer so that because root shows are so long and he plays so much during them that they're longer so he can rest his arm on his thigh while he plays. So he wow. can like play like this. So he's not always like this. So, yeah. So I thought that was interesting. I'd never yeah. known that, but like for, for his marathon session, for the marathon things that he does, it makes a whole lot of sense. So, Oh yeah. Anyway. And that's kind of a good, you know, um, there's a practical reason to that. Yeah. <laughs> so totally. now, all right, more about the, um, the, the performer that, that, that is playing as animal and Grover. I mean, I, w- what's his name? His name is Eric Robertson Robinson. Eric, I should know his name. Okay. That's his name is Eric something. That's fine. So, uh, is he a drummer? He is not a drummer. He, uh, I mean, I don't know. I could, I, sh- I could ask him, but um, he's just been animal forever and he just knows what to do and he sort of just makes it happen, but he's not a drummer. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause he's I, a puppeteer. I, he's a puppeteer, <laughs> but I think that uh, one thing that, that shouldn't be kind of glossed over is the, the, uh, is the Eric Jacobson. That's his name. Sorry. Okay. Jake, Eric on. Jacobson. One thing I will, uh, kudos to Eric Jacobson because I think that the attention to detail of, playing that because you yeah. even see it's talk, been it's been brought up on the show before of like movies where drummers are just real the humans worst. are so far off they're not even remotely on he's he's really does a great job i was also on that note just total sidebar i was watching pam and tommy today yeah uh, for whatever reason i watched and, it <laughs> and sebastian stan i thought like he was fairly convincing I, his left hand when he hit the snare drum was totally not convincing but like yeah. some of the like some of the, like splash grabs and stuff like that like yeah. he was nailing some of that stuff i was yeah. Pretty impressed yeah and I, that just his 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 movements are very tommy you know yeah. yeah i have a friend who who like that's his job he trained uh what was the guy about uh, he's a drummer and he goes deaf uh oh um the sound of metal yeah R- riz ahmed or whatever his name yeah, is yeah yeah my friend was a friend from high school was his drummer and trained him to play drums i thought was really interesting and that you know kind of fantastic that that people can pull that off i didn't yeah. see that movie but it's amazing yeah yeah i think that uh that's something i've heard in other um you know, things I've listened to where they'll say, oh, yeah, I learned to play guitar uh, or piano to 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 make it seem like it. But then they leave and they're kind of like, you know, uh, I've heard people say they don't they don't go home and are now an amazing drummer or pianist. They kind of right. can fake their way through it. Um, we but, did that with uh, Andrew Garfield on Tick, Tick, Boom, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Like he was a piano player and he, he was not a piano player or a singer, really. And we sort of made him into one for the movie. And he really went into it and uh, and kind of nailed it, which is pretty good. Yeah. You just got to do what you can to get to get through it, uh, which is uh, I don't I don't know if it would be easier or harder as a Muppet to be, you know, operating it underneath. Now, th- again, the question would be, uh, how do they do you, like, are you choreographing because a real drummer is playing the parts that the Muppet is playing? So, so with those, what happens is so he he is playing with his hands with this, the rods of the puppet he mm-hmm. is playing different parts of the of the drum set it's all plastic or whatever it is and he'll hit it but you can so you can kind of hear what he's doing so then what we do <laughs> this is a good part is what we do is in post we watch it and we sort of match the uh-huh. drums to him there's no one playing live with him there are situations where that has happened not on this uh on, on whenever someone is playing whenever grover is or whoever is playing the drums it's all done in post so our drummer, so the drummer for the Sesame Street band, who I should talk about, is this guy named Michael Kreuter. He was um, the drummer at Avenue Q for like 10 years. 
and is Cheetah Rivera's drummer and is a bunch of, he's, he's an unbelievable drummer and he's been with us forever. And he also mixes a lot of this stuff for Sesame Street. But anyway, mm. uh, so he will watch these things. And then between him and our orchestrator, assistant music director, Joe Feidler, who's a trombone player, uh, they'll sort of map out like what he's doing. And so then Mike will just sort of flail about until it sort of works with picture. But that's how we do it, which seems crazy, but that's what it is. I mean, I, I never, it, what's crazy is I never would have thought of that, but my sort of, and compared to you, small experience in TV and film is doing the ADR, the dialogue replacement stuff, which is sort of like that. That's sort yeah. of ADR for drumming. It's exactly I, the same thing. I never would have thought of that. It's syncing, you know, and mm-hmm. I, it's, um, I, I feel dumb now because I watch it now and I'm like, man, I, I thought it was like a choreographed thing or if they're looking off to the side at a drummer. I mean, that's it makes perfect well, we, sense. Well, we had talked previously about the Buddy Rich thing. My wonder yeah. is if the Buddy Rich thing is there was someone off stage doing it. Also, we've had situations where like Ernie was playing a trumpet and we brought our trumpet player, Kenny Rampton, onto the set and he actually played on the set and then Ernie mimed it. Like we've done the live version too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but with the drums, at least we, we do it all in post. That's that's for sure. And um, we should talk about that now because um, the Buddy Rich thing. So so well, before that, just to clarify, Muppets and Sesame Street are not the same, but the Henson Jim Henson characters are all Muppets. But the brand Mupp Kermit, Miss Piggy, Fozzie Bear, those are Muppets. And then yeah. Elmo Grover, um, you know, Big Bird. Sesame Street. Sesame Street. Yeah, that's that's usually how it's conceived of, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah gotcha. Um, but that being said, Animal, uh, which you, it's pretty neat that um, that the same guy is doing Animal and uh, Grover and all that stuff. That's mm-hmm. kind of he's kind of crossing l- like yeah. li- lines. He's actually, there. actually, you should. I think we should give credit to all of the pups. So the way that those particular puppets work, Animal, I think, is like the hand goes in the major part to do the mouth. And then there's two rods for the hands. Oh, I see. So some, sometimes one person does both rods or sometimes two people do one does each rod. So it could be a total of three people who are actually making animal actually play. Got I it. don't know. I've never seen animal in person, Okay. Um, but uh, I have watched Grover and Grover. That's what it was. I think it was three different people just sort of all playing the drums at the same time. Okay. So to oh, everyone yeah. who's involved, if they're somehow listening yeah. to this, they do a great job, but I mean, animal is, uh, is, I don't know. I feel like he's um, just an iconic. He he is a like like a visual, like an image of of what drummers use. Kind of like with like car guys. There's like the rat fink kind of like uh, sure. visual. He's he's like you know how many people have an animal tattoo or, mm. <laughs> or like an animal sitting on their their drum set. So um, obviously it's not Sesame Street, but it's worth noting that the Buddy Rich um, video, which I'll post on. Um, social media. I, I want to just read this because I, I I asked a Buddy Rich, um, really diehard fan, Louis Bernstein earlier. I said, "Can you give me any more info about Buddy on um, the Muppets?" Kind oh. of knowing that we would be talking about it a little bit, but it's it's different. So he said, "Hey Bart, from what I know, the show was filmed in England. Animals drumming was done by Ronnie Varell, who uh, played with uh, the drummer. He was the drummer for Ted Heath for many years and was fantastic. Uh, if you watch the full version, Buddy is playing his sticks on theater walls. If you listen to the audio of Buddy." Traps sound effects from a Vitaphone film. He sounds the same. That particular trap sound effects um, uh, film, which we, the old the audio is the only thing that exists, is from when Buddy was, I believe, twelve years old. It's cool because you can hear that same sound of him playing on the walls, and it sounds the same when he was twelve. Um, right. And I, th- I think Kathy Rich, his daughter, was the one who pushed him to do uh, to so be he- on the Muppets. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, and it really kind of revitalized his his image for the youth of the world. So well, well, didn't he, didn't he at that, at that point just become like this or was known as like this jerky band leader who just like threw sticks at people and was like a total jerk. I mean, like that's uh, sadly like buddy rich to me is, is similar to like, like John Bonham or Keith moon. They're like the more, more so Keith moon. They're like these polar things. They're known for like their unbelievable talent. Yeah. And then there's terrible side of them. There's like, seems to be at least for what the public knows, like no middle ground. Right which I think is sad because Buddy Rich was like this phenom, right? And like most, most, if you're not like a jazz head, you don't really know who Buddy Rich is, right? But like, which I think is, you know, which I think is a bummer because he was just so freaking talented. But anyway, just to go back for one second, like you're talking about Animal. To me, 
animal is a combination of all the greatest drummers put together. Yeah. So like if Keith Moon and Bonham and like Ginger Baker and blah, 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 all got together and had a baby or like each gave like, <laughs> like, like, it, like Ginger Baker's left foot and like yeah. Bonham's right foot and like whatever, like all kind of merge yeah. in one thing. Buddy's in hands or something. Yeah. 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 That's how I think about it. And also like Buddy, like, like to me, like he took every, like all the rudiment tree stuff and just yeah. like put it on bionic speed like it's all the stuff that you practice and stuff is like a drummer like traditional gripping stuff and da, 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 da. and then and then he just did it like 300 times better than anyone else right yeah. it was just it was all the same oh, stuff yeah. but like he was just like so badass at it that it was yeah. just like yeah i mean he's uh he's been covered and talked about a lot on the show and i will say mm -hmm. that uh you know you want to say respectfully that yes I mean, Buddy was an icon and everyone loves him, but there are the Buddy Rich tapes, which are famous of someone recorded uh, on, yeah. on the bus, which ended up in like Seinfeld episodes and stuff. But uh, yeah, he had kind of a, a very tough. Uh, he didn't put up with anything that he didn't like. Um, so so to have him on a kid's show playing with a, uh, you know, a Muppet, which I guess a question would be how how big is I, I know you haven't seen him, but if you had to guess roughly how big like a couple like a foot and a half two feet yeah, like maybe a foot and a half. not very big yeah and they're then, always smaller than you think interesting yeah um just to see buddy going at that and and, yeah. and having fun he appeared to have fun um because he was a child star so i mean i think right. he understands that that stuff but that's such an iconic uh yeah it's a great moment i hadn't watched it until i mean i i had seen it but i hadn't like watched it in full until you mentioned it to me and it's it's really great like it's really you know, and, and also there's some other great moments it, it, we were talking before, not to change the subject, but yep. I will, about rhythm in Sesame Street. Like there's just like little tidbits about like people playing different native instruments of Africa or something else or like all kinds of stuff. And it's all based in rhythm. And so every year we have like a curriculum seminar where we go and we learn about like what the year's curriculum is going to be, for example, like, like STEAM, science, technology, blah, 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 math. Mm -hmm. And then like, like this year, the next couple of years about racial injustice. So like everything that's sort of capped around that, but like in years past, it had been about, you know, just about particular math things. And so it was like, well, what are we going to do musically? And then the answer was like, well, what works with kids all the time? And the, and the answers were always like, like uh, call and repeats. And then like just repeating things, generally speaking, and being very rhythmic about things. So like when I'm writing songs for Sesame street, and when I tell people how to write songs, I'm always saying, write something that's an earworm on top of an earworm. So like an earworm verse, an earworm chorus, the same earworm verse, the same earworm chorus, and you're out because you only have like a minute and a half to yeah. do it. And then I'm like, and while you're doing that, like create a pulse. Like I think the thing that kids these days are looking for, at least what my kids listen to on the radio is all based in rhythm. Everything is based with even ballad. There's no more ballads, right? There's yeah. no more like ballads with no time, right? Everything, even like um, easy on me, the Adele thing, right? Which came out has like a pulsing, kick drum that happens like yep. i don't know by the second verse and so like like everything has a rhythm there's so few just like like i'm working on a thing like just doing like a like when does the orchestra ever play without a rhythm section right like that barely happens every anymore so yeah. it's just like everything's you know so plus like everything's on a click and blah 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 cause sure we don't teach like people how to have time anymore but that's a whole other <laughs> subject altogether um yeah. so so yeah so i think like with sesame street it was like it was like that the consistency of rhythm helps to really get out whatever uh, helps to get out of the way so we can focus on the thing. And it also becomes like what I like to call like some sort of trance situation where like a kid's watching something and they just like get into the song. And you, the hope is, is like if, if they can um, liken their movements or the rhythm of the thing to what it's actually trying to teach and all of those things trying to get smushed in together and the kid actually learns something then you're doing your job. Right. I mean, like yeah. and at the end of the day, like I can write the greatest song ever, if it's not being used as a teaching mechanism, for, to, particularly for Sesame Street, then what's the point, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and to get kind of philosophical about it, those those beats where it's just consistent, and you're talking with kids, bass drum sometimes known as the the mother drum because it's a heartbeat. These mm -hmm. kids aren't too far away from being in their mom's womb. You know what I sure. mean? I can tell you from having a two year. I mean, I remember watching. I, I had a, my son was born in 2019. After, you know, a couple months later, we're all stuck at home in 2020. So Sesame Street was on a lot. <laughs> and um, and it 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 just kind of it, it feels good. And it's something that's it, you're not just you don't you guys don't talk down to kids like there are certain I think other people would understand YouTube is great. I love YouTube. This will be on YouTube, this video. But uh, there are certain people uh, who are very popular where it's like bizarre 
and I don't yeah. really like it. it. Yeah. And, uh, and it's wait just till, like, wait your kids get older. It's a whole other, whole oh, other I bet, realm. I bet, I bet. But I mean, so that's good to know about the curriculum and how you guys, you guys mix it into everything. And yeah. so we'll, we'll keep it the, the conversation rhythmic and percussive, but I just want to say that the topics that you cover are, uh, you got to almost think of things as a child, like crossing the street and holding you know, your hand. And I remember um, there was someone who was talking about a Mr. Rogers episode, which is obviously different, but everyone loves Mr. Rogers about uh, not being scared to be sucked down the drain in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. And I remember a dad or someone thought it it was some documentary. This might be a popular thing that other people have seen, but he said this. I thought it was the stupidest thing in the world. I thought, why are we watching this? Such a waste of time until the his son became scared of being washed and sucked down the um, the drain. And then it, it hit him like, oh, okay, there is a reason. So for yeah. you guys to think of these minor little things, make a big song out of it, uh, sharing, whatever, and, and add rhythm to it is it's really powerful, you know? I agree. It's yeah. it's sometimes it's, it's more powerful than you even think about. It. And then you go and you see the effects of some of these songs that I've written or people have, you know, gotten in touch with me and like this. But also it, people have gotten in touch with me and been like, holy cow, my daughter will knows how to do this because of the song you wrote. It's just very, that, that's a surreal experience. Yeah. And I truly think that like, oh, my, uh, whatever, you, whoever is saying this, my son, my daughter uh, wants to be a drummer because they saw Questlove playing on Sesame Street and they're going to buy a Ludwig kit because they saw that logo that wasn't covered. <laughs> winning and winning. <laughs> yes. totally. So another one that I want to bring up, which I, I don't expect you to have seen every single one of these. I think this was before your time was um, the great uh, Dame Evelyn Glennie, um, who who performed on there, who is a unbelievable percussionist who happens to be deaf. And um, she was on there and I'll post this online so people can see it. But she was talking with um Oscar and I believe it was Grover and they were Oscar was of course being classic Oscar talking about you know I don't want you're not going to be in the Grouch Gatiers I believe was the band um and breaking down about how she had to take her shoes off to feel the the feel the music mm-hmm. and and she's playing his trash cans and kind of warms him up there's something so I guess just that that dichotomy i guess you'd say of of uh or the juxtaposition to throw big words out there of of oscar being grouchy and then you warm him up with this woman who's amazing percussionist who has is deaf uh was really 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 powerful um and just and just very cool to see that um which i guess there's not a question there it's more of a comment but it raises two of of how do you guys on the on the uh on the technical side how do you mic things up on stage like because she was playing Um trash cans and, and all that stuff you know yeah uh technically wise uh uh it depends on the gig um it depends on who's there like for example like when anderson pock like we were talking about was on the thing like we had all these drums but they were all muffled so that we didn't hear anything right mm-hmm. but like we had I'm trying to remember oh, oh okay here's a good example we, we did this thing called elmo's late night talk show uh which was fantastic and we had yes. sarah Bareilles on and sarah Bareilles brought Mona Takavoli, do you know her? She's no. Jason, she's Jason Moran's percussionist and she plays Cajon and like shakers and all this other stuff. But um she has this custom, it's her own, you know, line of Cajon. <laughs> and uh and Sarah played ukulele and her another woman who's in Jason's band played ukulele and Mona and so like, you know, you you hike it, you mic it and monitor it just like in any other rock show, right? So we're just like sticking SM7s and things around and doing mm-hmm. our thing, you know. And then like, I don't know, with some punchy bass drum mic we put in into the cajon and like I, I wasn't really paying attention, although I probably should have. And then like, you know, she sings into Shores and Sennheisers and stuff like that. And yep. the the ukuleles went direct because that's what ukuleles do and sure. blah blah blah. Um with Quest though. I, I don't remember what the mic was. It two AK like four fourteens above him, and then like some other stuff. I don't remember. Yeah, um, but that's but cool. Like, I, it might have been. I think it wouldn't surprise me if that's what it was. And he uses that. But he didn't have it like that crazy thing that he puts on the the sub thing that he puts yeah. on the kick drum, which I don't think he had. But like that makes it sound amazing. Yeah. Um, no, that's awesome though. It's good to know that because sometimes it might be. Um uh i don't know a specific thing where there's like you know like little mics around that are picking things up but drums are not the same as like a vocalist where they might have like a mic kind of hidden or a love but because drums are loud drums are extremely loud it's true um so that's cool all right so then um i think historically there's some really cool ones that i'll just mention that uh that again i don't uh expect you have seen every single one of these but there's a really cool old video of of uh 
some kids finding a 50 gallon drum, rolling it through New York. They take Mm. it, they cut it, they make a steel drum, like a steel pan out of it. Uh, And just things like that, where I don't think kids would ever be exposed to that kind of how that's made. Uh, Mm -hmm. those, Those little like side segments that you guys go out and shoot. Yeah. Um, how does how do those typically work? I mean, is that just a separate crew that goes out and films? And so we have like this, our own separate film department. And the way the films work is they're sort of outsourced. And so we'll come up with topics and like things, and we'll we'll put out things to film to film people who make short films. And be like, do you want to do a or, or we want to do a thing about drums and filmmaking or drums in the city? And someone will come back with a proposal, and then we'll sort of go out to them. The ones that are music heavy, like I'm sort of. I sort of consult on just to make sure like they sound good and like blah, blah, um, I sometimes write the music for the underscoring and things like that. But, mm-hmm. um, but yeah. And then like people just come back with their ideas. I think it's cool. I, you know, now, nowadays it's what we call user generated content in the past. It was just called films. <laughs> and so, so, you know, it's, it, it's different now. Um, but, um, but yeah, it gives, it gives people who watch the show and are inspired by it sort of like you and anybody really to, to, to try to, try to get, you know, have some input in it, which I think is really cool. I, I've always thought those interstitials are cool. There's one in, we have a music episode called Elmo's Music Magic, where there's like a whole thing about people, about beatboxing. And there's a whole thing about um, the wind instruments where there's just a bunch of kids running around playing wind instruments, but that are not traditional wind instruments. Um, yeah. Yeah, just stuff like that. I think is great. Yeah, I, I, I there was one I was watching today. Obviously, I, I watched a lot of these kind of in preparation for this. And uh, there was one where Elmo, I believe, went to a drum school in New York mm-hmm. and was playing yeah. with all these little kids. And it was just so cool. And um, I think kids obviously are have, have a lot of fun talking to the, the Muppets. But it it must be kind of uh, I feel like adults might and you would know this adults may, might sometimes famous adults who are performers do people sometimes feel silly at first and have to like let down their guard? Like I'm talking to, you know, uh, some fabric on someone's hand. Sure. D- does that take I'll, a little getting used so, to so, sometimes, but for the most part, I like to think that the two, I think there's two things I think about this, like walking onto the set of Sesame street is what I always tell people is like walking into the oval office. I've never walked into the oval office, but I assume that it's the same <laughs> thing where like all of the air, the air changes, the temperature changes, like everything's different. Even yeah, if sure. it didn't change at all. Right. It's just like a very different. And like, people are just like, you can see like their whole childhood like flashes before their eyes. And then when they meet a Muppet, I, I mean, most of the time when parents come, they have their kids with them. And so to watch this experience through your kid, you're like, Holy cow, this is yeah. unbelievable. And then, the parent weirdly and or not has most of the time has the same exact uh, reaction because, right. because you as a kid wanted to meet Elmo or Grover also. And so when you actually do get to meet him and also like I, for example, when I started working there was like embarrassed and weird about it. So I would never look them in the eye, look the puppet in the eye. And so now I do it all the time. So like, if I'm talking to Grover, I'm talking to Grover like this so that, you know, we can really have a conversation with him. Cause that's, that's the thing. Like you want that suspension of disbelief as much as possible. Like you want, that's the whole goal of the whole thing. And yeah. so I feel like, I feel like if you don't, if you aren't doing that, then like the magic's lost on you. Not that that's a bad thing, but it's just like, it's a different, it's a different sort of thing. I will say a great story about, I brought my daughter when she was like four or something. And she was just like, like out of, like, couldn't believe what was happening. And then I brought her two years later and she kept on looking behind Elmo to see like what was going on behind him. So she had like, she, she was older and sort of like the, the magic was different. Like it was, it was, she was still like, Holy cow. But it was like, she's like, it was more being like inquisitive. Like, how is this happening? Right. Mm. As opposed to just being like, a piece of felt is talking to me, right? Yeah. So it's a different, it's the magic always changes, but the, the good news is what I think is like, it's always magical. Like yeah. no matter what age you are, you meet a Abby or Elmo or her and you're just like, holy cow, it's a person. It's a real thing. It's an yeah. absolute real thing, you know? So Yeah. And it's like the, um, the Disney thing where you never want to see them with their heads off. You know what right. I mean? Cause it terrifies kids, but that, that has to be a little bit of like, uh, you're seeing how the, you know, the product is made. So it's a little different than seeing it on screen where you never see, the hands and the operators right. or anything like that. But I'm sure you get, it's your job. You get used to that pretty quickly. You do. So, um, I mean, this is all, is there any other drum stuff that comes to mind for you? I know there was a really cool one about, I, I love that you guys are very multicultural. Mm-hmm. There's Tycho episodes. Mm-hmm. There's awesome stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's so eclectic and, and you just learn about things that as, as a, I was watching the Tycho one earlier and as an adult who has 150 plus hours um, uh, of doing these these episodes, um, 
I, I think it's just seriously awesome to uh, to to see that and and learn things from these puppets. You know, it's just very Absolutely. very cool. I will say just like a last thing. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite people who came on who didn't play drums is a drummer is Dave Grohl, and I didn't. I wrote that song, um, uh, and I didn't get to go to LA to meet him or have him or be at the recording session. I was so bummed because I had to do something. But um, he is one of my favorite drummers of all time, and. Uh, was one of my favorite guests of all time, just cause like he bought into it immediately. Like he was just so, and like, he's also done some stuff with the Muppets, like all of that stuff that he does with animal and all yeah. that stuff, which is great. Yeah. He's, he's one of my favorite people. So I just, I don't know. just wanted to say his name out loud. He's oh great. yeah. Yeah. Cause um, when I emailed you, I said, yo drummers on the show uh, that we should talk about Dave Grohl. And then I was looking into it and watching it. And I was like, Oh yeah, he played guitar. Yeah. You know, it's, it wasn't cause you know, but he does do the, the, the animal stuff. Um, yeah. But awesome, Bill. Well, um, this is just so cool. So you obviously do a bunch of other stuff uh, with, especially with Lynn Manuel Miranda. Um, that's just that's got to be. I mean, you you were doing some really big big films. We've done, some, we've done some fun stuff. We did the In the Heights movie. We did Tick Tick Boom. Yes, uh, he did Encanto, which was like the biggest freaking song movie ever. Yeah, which is so great. Um, yeah, we've been friends since college, and uh, we were roommates for like five years after college and we remain i was the best man at his wedding although i didn't get to go because my daughter was born on the same day as his <laughs> Matt, as wedding Jeez, uh, that takes precedence a little bit <laughs> yeah, we were there at the birth of both of our all of our children and he's a you know he's been a really good friend and it's very, very funny to watch him sort of rise into superstardom but you know we always just sort of we call each other a lot and like facetime and shoot the shit and so it's great. yeah, he's a, good, yeah. He's a great person that's awesome. All right. Well, um, I think this is great. It's just a fun. It's kind of a different episode than talking about the history of Ludwig or something where it's very <laughs> drum. I, I like to keep it eclectic and have people on like you who 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 uh, I mean, what a cool job. And I love that you are not um, jaded is might not be the right word or just uh, just, a, you know, you understand the importance of what you're doing um, and it is very cool. So uh, it, is there anywhere you want to tell people to find more about you or anything oh, like that? I have a website, popmusicmisery.com. You can find me on Instagram at bsherman2222, I think. And the same thing on Twitter. And um, yeah, there's, cool. that's me. Cool. Well, um, again, so thanks to Lewis Bernstein for giving me some buddy info. And thanks to Greg Wells for uh, Always with, Greg Wells. With, without even, I mean, trying. He helped me. Uh, so everyone can also check out the Quest Love Supreme podcast with you. I mean, that's everything you're doing is very cool and you're a hardworking guy. And uh, I'm, I'm glad it's paying off. And uh, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Absolutely. Good luck with the second kid. Uh, you're going back to man to man, man on man. It's tough. <laughs> yeah. It's long. It's a long road, but uh, yeah. be strong. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Hi, Bart.